imagine being the brother of Jesus. You know, his stepbrother, I guess you'd say, or half-brother, because after all, Jesus was the son of God and born of Mary, but Jesus' brethren and sisters were from Joseph and Mary. <coughs> but imagine being the brother of Jesus. You know, like maybe after they grew up. Uh, Mom, Jesus has done it again. He, he went hometown, you know, and stirred up a whole bunch of problems. They said he thinks he's the son of God or something, you know. And Mom, you're going to have to have a talk with him. Old Mom would look at him and say, well, yeah, but you got to let Jesus kind of find his own way, you know. He's, he's got to find himself. <laughs> More real than they do. So it'd be kind of weird, you know, to have literally the physical manifestation of God himself in the flesh as fully human and then to be his brother. Huh. <laughs> be kind of weird. Hey, Jesus, can you do that water and wine thing again? You know, I, I really like that. You know, there might be a benefit, but somehow I don't think that's quite the way it went down. But I think sometimes we mistake the reality of God in our life for <coughs> just being a part-time thing. You know, when the family's around, we're back to our old ways and the way we were before, or we're trying too hard to witness to them and tell them something that they don't want to hear. Somewhere in between, there should be this reality of knowing God and then seeing something different in us that they might want of us. You know, my family, give you a good example, they really have seen my ups and downs and things that don't make any sense to them at all. As a matter of fact, my sister Mary Lynn, we call her Chickadee. My sister Chick doesn't believe a word I say. <laughs> and somehow, today's devotion gives me great encouragement. <laughs> because it isn't always about your family accepting you as you are becoming because they think of you as you were, not as you are. They may have seen some of the trials and tribulations you've gone through while experiencing what God is doing in you and may not understand some of the things you've gone through because they're not where you're at. But that's okay because you see Jesus' family really didn't understand him at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when he was on his way to go get crucified, you know, he says, Hey, I'm checking out of here. You know, I'm heading for home. You know, this I've had enough of this world, man. We're we're out of here. His family came to stop him. You know, they said, No, Jesus, we're not letting you go to Jerusalem. You'll get killed. <laughs> we don't want you to get killed. Well, he went on his own. He didn't go with his family to the feast at that time, but he showed up later. And they saw him and realized, oh no, here we go. And sure enough, they were right. He got killed. But they, like all others, really understood the resurrection in a metaphorical way. Kind of like, well, yeah, God could do it, but will he do it? Nah, we haven't seen it. And they kind of understood miracles because they were kind of country folk in a way. So they'd say, well, it could be done, but not after you're dead, 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 you know. Now, we, we know Lazarus came back to life, but you know, there's still some questions there, you know. Three days, yeah, that was, that was pretty long. But to actually believe that Jesus was going to come back to life when they saw him crucified, no. Nobody believed. Nobody had that capability from God himself to actually accept the fact that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. So, they encouraged each other and spoke much about what he had said and what he had taught because that's how it's communicated and that's how it was remembered, was verbally and written down also. But 
Imagine having to deal with that conflict that Jesus had, on the one hand loving his family, but on the other hand doing the will of his Father. He came to do that perfect will that God chose for him to do. He sought out every day in his personal time alone with God to ask God what to do that day and every day that he was alive. So for three years, or three and a half years as we say, that Jesus lived a perfect life according to walking in the Spirit, talking in the Spirit, and moving according to God's will. He was perfect, and he sinned not. That amazes me, man. I think that's kind of cool. Now, no offense, I think the closer you get to God, the more people are going to want to crucify you. <laughs> it just seems to be the way of the world. While we want help where we're at, we're not always ready to give up what we got. You see, that's the part of really discipleship that gets the challenge in us. Are we willing to give up any part of our life to follow Jesus Christ? Are we willing to lay down those things we've fought for, bought with our hard blood, sweat, and tears, or that we have felt like was our right and privilege to enjoy? Oh God, this is mine, mine, mine. Are we willing to lay that down? Are we willing, really, to be like Isaac you know Isaac, Abraham and Isaac, you know, Isaac wasn't like a little boy that we see in the movies, but Isaac was probably about oh, 20 or 30, well, maybe about 20 years old, and Abraham was about oh, 90, and here you got this old man <clears throat> that goes with his son, you know, marching along, you know, and they're, <coughs> they're going to offer a sacrifice to God, you know, and by that time, you know, Isaac was pretty confident about you know, what Abraham was. He was a man of God, you know. So it was kind of like, okay. Hey, Father, you know, we got the, we got the, uh, we got the wood. You know, I see that. We got the knife. <laughs> I see that. And uh, we got the cords, you know, the rope. But uh, where's the sacrifice? And, you know, old sly Abraham says, ah, don't worry about it, Isaac. God will provide himself a sacrifice. God will take care of it. Well, about that time, you know, they get to where God says, this is the place. And Abraham says, okay, Isaac, I got a little surprise for you. I got some good news, and I got some bad news. So Isaac says, uh, well, what's the good news? He says, well, God provided a sacrifice. Isaac goes, oh, good, what's the bad news? You're it. Oh, so? Isaac, as a willing son, actually let Abraham time up. Now, right there, I think we ought to call child services in. You know, we ought to call the police. We ought to call in the angels, call in somebody, because old Isaac or old Abraham has lost his marbles. Ain't no way that we're going to let some old coot, you know, named Abraham sacrifice his son. And yet, that is what's recorded in the scriptures. So, here we got oh willing Isaac you know just dumb enough to crawl up on that altar you know that Abraham built with his own hands and while they put those rocks together he knew what he was going to do so he takes out that bloody knife that he'd used before on sacrifices and he raises it and he gets ready to kill and sure enough some angel comes down you know and says Ow. hold the horses <laughs> and God no 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 God doesn't want you to do that now I know you know that you really would do it I just tested you, old lady. Well, okay, you know, and Abraham looks over, and sure enough, there's a, a ram caught with its horns in a thicket, you know, which is a bush, kind of like out there in the desert. And uh, <coughs> so Abraham goes ahead and tells Isaac, Hey, look, check it out. I don't have to kill you. I'm going to go kill that goat. And uh, <laughs> Isaac says, Yeah, I'm with you. Let's go do it. <laughs> and he made like quick stuff of that sacrifice because you know that he didn't want to die but the interesting thing is, is that how willing are you 
I know you're willing to be Abraham, but are you willing to be Isaac? You see, that's the difference between Jesus and us. In discipleship, we come to a place where we have to decide who's really in charge. Is it God or us? Are we the ones that are directing our own lives according to our understanding? Or are we seeking each day to operate in a humble, simple way, seeking His direction, His will, His choices for our life? Jesus said that an interesting statement that really makes me feel comfortable about looking over the past of my life, when He said that the wind bloweth whither it will, you need to know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. And my life makes sense to me, while to some others it may not make much comprehension in their perspective. Because I've moved around a lot in life. God has moved me different places and I've been able to <coughs> learn, share, develop, or in some way relate God to that situation in my life and discover what God's purpose was for it. Maybe, even though his family didn't understand, after Jesus rose from the dead, maybe some comprehension came upon them because we have the book of James, which is Jesus' brother speaking. And he does talk a lot about, you know, heaven and God and eternal plan. So I think maybe Sometimes, things that happen in our life are there more so for a purpose that we don't know about than what we do. And the reason why we have to trust Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 so much is because we really don't have a handle on all that's happening in life if we are to be his disciple. So in utmost, the conditions of discipleship if any man come to me and hate not, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. If the closest relationships of life clash with the claims of Jesus Christ, he says it must be instant obedience to himself and not yourself. We must choose him over all others. Discipleship means personal, passionate devotion to a person, to Jesus himself to our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a difference between devotion to a person and devotion to principles or to a cause. There are many patriotic people. There are many people that swear up and down to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth and lie. There are many people that choose to serve the people and serve themselves. There are many people that choose to exercise their rights and privileges, but in fact abuse that with which they've been given. Our Lord never proclaimed a cause. He proclaimed personal devotion to himself. To be a disciple is to be a devoted love slave of the Lord Jesus, to be devoted to him in personal relationship. Many of us will call ourselves Christians are not devoted to Jesus Christ. No man on earth has his passionate love to the Lord unless the Holy Spirit has imparted it to him. We don't make a choice one day and say, I think I'll just follow God. But rather, God causes a thirst and desire in us that is only satisfied in loving Jesus and serving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength with literally being following and obeying the Lord our God. Whenever the Holy Ghost sees a chance of glorifying Jesus, he will take your heart, he will take your nerves, he will take your soul, he will take your being. He will take your whole personality and simply make, and simply make you blaze and glow with devotion to Jesus. People should say, I don't know about that man, but he loves Jesus. They should say, I don't know really what he's all about, but he loves Jesus. They should say, I don't know really all about him, but he loves Jesus. He follows hard after Jesus. He wants Jesus. 
David was a man after God's own heart. And that was the reputation that he had. And I see that reputation as not being having God's heart, but choosing to pursue God. David was after, going after God's own heart. David wanted to be like God's heart of love. Was he? No. But he wanted to be. And that's the way I see David. I think we all have been given a gift from the Holy Spirit that can cause us to be in love with God if we choose to pursue that love with our whole heart, our soul, our mind, our being, our strength, even our possessions and our desires. The Christian life is stamped by moral, spontaneous originality. Consequently, the disciple is open to the same charge and accusation that Jesus was, that being one of inconsistency. But Jesus Christ was never inconsistent. He was always consistent to what God wanted him to do. And the Christian must be consistent to the life of the Son of God in him, not consistent to the hard and fast creeds and credos with which men organize their lives and make structure of their being. Men pour themselves into their ideas, their concepts, their structures, and their buildings. And God has to blast them out of their prejudices before they can become devoted to Jesus Christ. <coughs> Who won't you love? Who do you hate? Who do you think will never accept God and His salvation? I know that except that a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. I know that there are Christians who can't abide under the presidency currently because they don't like what God is doing and causing in them to recognize their fleshy attitudes and actions. They don't recognize that possibly they have used the Muslim or some other ethnic group as a scapegoat for their own sinfulness, for their own prejudices and bigotry in the same way that the black man at one time, the Negro, was treated as being a slave. So likewise, now we see there's a reverse happening, where now we pick an external ethnic group and claim that they're all bad and no good. You see, being a disciple of Jesus Christ means that you break down the last barriers of your own prejudices own hardness of heart, the very immigrant that you think that you hate, whether it be legal or illegal, is irrelevant to the fact of Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. Every single person, every human being, has a right and a privilege to experience God's love in such a way that they can choose for themselves which way they will go. Because if they really desire, if they really find that love of God, they will choose eternal life. It's obvious because they will feel so loved by those who claim to know him that they will want that and desire it above all else. But unless that love is made manifest, then all you're presenting to a person is a religious concept, a religious idea, a religion that has no power to change people's lives. Because it is only God's love in us that ever changes a person to turn a heart toward him and receive from him that personal relationship. If you haven't experienced God's love, really, if you don't know God personally, you can't love people. You really can't, because they will literally piss you off. They will tick you off. They will frustrate you. They will aggravate you. They will cause you to come to a place where you can no longer stand being in their very presence in some way or some person or even some group or some ethnicity but when the love of God when God's love has been shed abroad in your heart and you reflect that back to him and you love God that much you will love those whom he has chosen which is the world for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life you will love those that others cannot whether it be the child abuser, whether it be the murderer, whether it be those that have been lost and completely tw 
twisted in their mindset, in their heart and soul, that you'll pray for them, for them to be made whole. That you will care enough, that you'll dare enough to be that Isaac, to be that Jesus that laid down his life, even for the enemies that were seeking to crucify him. That is what a disciple is all about.